Lee Matthews was born on July 8, 1983. Daughter of Rob and Sharon Matthews, she had an older sister named Karen. She lived with her family in the suburbs of Johannesburg, of South Africa. Lee was a university student studying accounting at Bond University. Everyone saw her as a charismatic, popular girl who was in the prime of her life. On the night of July 8, 2004, the young woman's family decided to celebrate her 21st birthday. To do so, they had dinner at a Chinese restaurant and then headed to a Pirates of the Caribbean themed party at a rented club. That night, as a birthday present, her parents gave Lee a Tanzanite ring, a valuable stone. The day after the celebration, July 9, 2004, a Friday, Lee left in the morning to go to the university. She was wearing jeans, a sweater, and a leather jacket. The young woman also had her valuable ring that her parents had given her as a birthday present. But she decided to leave it in her pants pocket and only wear it inside the university premises so as not to draw it too much attention. Upon arriving at the university, the young woman realized that her mother's credit card was with her. She thought that her mother would probably need it, and so she decided to call her to let her know. In a phone conversation, the two agreed to meet at 10 a.m. in the university parking lot so Sharon could pick up her credit card. At the agreed time, Sharon arrived in the parking lot, but Lee wasn't there. She then decided to wait a while, as she thought that maybe her daughter was busy with her studies. However, time passed, and Lee still hadn't show up. Worried, Sharon got out of the car and started asking people nearby if they had seen her daughter, and everyone said no. Even more worried, Sharon made several calls to her daughter, but they all went to voicemail. She then went looking for the young woman throughout the university. Sometime later, one of Lee's friends said he had seen her walking towards the university parking lot shortly before 10 a.m. and that she was alone. Another witness, who is also a student at the university, said he saw the girl talking to a strange man there. Even after walking through most of the university, Sharon couldn't find her daughter anywhere. She kept calling the young lady and finally someone answered. However, it wasn't Lee, but a man who claimed that he had kidnapped the young woman and that he was also in possession of her vehicle. Initially, Lee's mother laughed, believing it to be some joke made by her daughter's friends. But after some time of conversation, she realized it was something serious. The man on the other end of the line said he wasn't kidding and he wouldn't hesitate to take the girl's life if Sharon didn't do exactly what he said. After the first contact, Sharon immediately called her husband and repeated the conversation she had with the kidnapper. Rob was completely desperate and called his daughter's cell phone to speak with the criminal. To Lee's father, the man said he wanted 300,000 rand, South African currency, in exchange for the girl's freedom. He also said that if Rob involved the police, the girl would suffer the consequences instantly. After the conversation, Rob Matthews went to two different bank branches and withdrew the amount requested by the criminal. While driving, he called a private investigation firm that specializes in cases like this and arranged to meet one of the agents at a gas station. Upon meeting with this agent, Rob was advised to go to the police. They then got in touch with the superintendent of police who arrived half an hour later and advised Rob to do what he wanted. He advised him to give what the kidnapper asked, but to give him only 50,000 instead of the 300,000 requested. While her father planned the rescue, Lee's mother had the opportunity to speak with her daughter again. Lee was crying a lot and told her mother that she wasn't hurt, but asked her to do everything the kidnapper asked and not involve the police. The kidnapper called Rob several times to find out how the case was going. After much insistence from the girl's father, the criminal ended up agreeing to accept only 50,000 for the ransom. They arranged to meet at 8 p.m. that day at a toll plaza in the city. For the meeting, the police sent an officer in the back seat of Rob's car. Rob had the money in an envelope in front of the passenger seat and drove to the location normally. But halfway there, Rob began to wonder what might happen if the kidnapper happened to see the policeman hiding in the car. He then stopped on the side of the road and asked the police to get out, for fear of what might happen to his daughter. According to sources, Rob found the kidnapper shortly after he dismissed the officer. 
The criminal somehow noticed that he had stopped to do something, got nervous and started cursing the girl's father. After that, the kidnapper returned to his car and asked Rob to follow him for a few meters and wait for his signal. They drove until the criminal stopped his vehicle, flashed his lights three times as a signal, while Rob parked his car beside him, opened his window and threw the envelope with the money into the kidnapper's car. Afterwards, the kidnapper ordered Rob to return home and wait for his call in which he would inform him where Rob could find his daughter. Rob returned home and after about an hour of no news, he started calling his daughter's cell phone in hopes of reaching the perpetrator. The calls, however, all went to voicemail. Rob continued trying to contact the kidnapper until around 11.30 p.m. After numerous failed attempts, he feared the worst and decided to ask the police for help again. A task force of 15 police officers was mobilized, and an office was set up in the Joint Operations Center at the Johannesburg Police Station. The team also equipped an entire screening room to detect the location of the criminal. However, the man didn't make any calls, neither that night nor throughout the next day. On the night of July 10, 2004, Rob and Sharon Matthews held a press conference announcing their daughter's kidnapping to the media. At the time, Rob said that the kidnapper claimed to be from Libya, but that the man had a strong accent that sounded Indian, even if he tried to disguise it. The couple asked for any information that could help bring Lee back alive. Forty hours after the kidnapping, Lee's parents held a new press conference. They were even more shaken and questioned what kind of person could do such a thing. In the meantime, the police task force increased to 150 officers to cover the case. The case quickly took on major national repercussions, with media coverage across the country. It is said that the case of Lee Matthews was one of the most covered by the media in South Africa. During the investigation, the police were able to track the young woman's cell phone signal, which signaled to towers in the Walkerview area, a village of just over 9,000 inhabitants in the region. After screening, the police mobilized several helicopters and ground vehicles to search the entire detected area. However, nothing was found. On July 21st, 12 days after the kidnapping of Lee Matthews, a council worker was weeding a dirt path alongside the R82 road in the village of Walkerville when he came across a human body on the edge of the site. It was a young white woman. Immediately he called the police, who drove as quickly as possible to the scene. The detectives already suspected who it could be, and when they arrived at the scene and did the first analysis, they confirmed their suspicions. Indeed, the body was Lee Matthews. According to forensics, the body was already in the early stages of decomposition. It was squeaky clean, which indicated it had been placed there recently. Furthermore, four bullet shells were found neatly grouped beside the body, as if someone had purposely placed them there. There was also a piece of brown duct tape next to the body that had unidentified fingerprints on it. According to the coroner's report, the cause of death was due to injuries caused to the head and chest caused by four shots. Still, according to the report, there were no other signs of violence or forced relations. Later, the police were able to locate Lee's car, which was abandoned in a park. After news broke that Lee was found dead, her family was devastated. And to top it off, some media outlets began to report that if Rob had paid the full amount requested by the kidnapper, his daughter could be alive, which further increased the family's suffering. The police launched a major investigation, using the various pieces of evidence left at the crime scene. After several days of getting nowhere, the case was turned over to Police Detective Superintendent Pete Bailiot, who decided to change the investigative perspective of the case. Instead of paying attention to the forensic and body data, the new person in charge of the case decided to go back to the crime scene to analyze possible external factors. He also began listening to Lee's family and friends to understand how she could have been kidnapped. All of Lee's friends interviewed by the police said that she would never go anywhere with a stranger. Furthermore, it was found that all people who entered the university that day passed the standard check, which indicated that the kidnapper was probably someone the girl knew, perhaps one of the local students. From then on, the police began to interview each of the university students, looking mainly for those who had an Indian accent 
as indicated by the victim's father. Among all those interviewed, the one who most called the attention of police was Donovan Mugli, a 24-year-old boy who is of Indian origin. After some investigation, detective discovered that he lived with his parents and had entered university earlier that year. Prior to that, he had worked in a company's finance department for three years before being fired on suspicion of fraud. The company, however, didn't file a complaint with the police due to lack of evidence. With Donovan Moodley as their prime suspect, police began looking for hotel reservations in the area where the ransom was paid. According to detectives, the kidnapper must have stayed there to have somewhere to hide in case something went wrong or the victim's family called the police. Upon searching, detectives discovered that Donovan had booked a hotel room in the area, having checked in on July 6 and paid for two nights. Then he went back and paid for two more nights at the same place. Police also discovered that Donovan made three deposits into his bank account in the month of July, having deposited $17,000 on the 15th as well as two deposits on the 27th, one of $14,000 and another of $4,000. Police also discovered that the boy had a motorcycle that had been damaged in an accident the previous month. The boy would have called a workshop and scheduled the repair of the vehicle. According to the mechanic in charge, he said he didn't have the money to pay at the time, but he would soon. Since he was a regular customer, the mechanic let him pay later. A few days after Lee's ransom was paid, Donovan paid off the repair shop's debt. In addition, the boy also had several other unusual expenses in those days, with designer shoes, expensive restaurants, and a yacht charter, where he proposed to his girlfriend and gave her a very expensive ring. After all this evidence, Donovan Moodley was placed under constant surveillance and all his phone records were checked. Police were able to determine that the suspect's cell phone was the same location at the rescue at the time it happened. Detectives also looked into the possibility that Donovan might not have been acting alone. According to investigations, he had a friend with whom he spoke several times on the phone at the time of the kidnapping. This friend had a small business of refrigerated equipment close to the rescue site and on the day the body was supposed to be placed where it was found, the same friend left work early. Police said the body had frostbite on part of the hands and feet. They believe it was kept in a cooling facility for a few days before it was spawned. According to detectives, Lee's life was probably taken shortly after the kidnapping and even before the ransom was paid. Both Donovan's home and his friend's premises were searched, but no evidence that Lee was there was found. Despite being students at the same university, Lee and Donovan didn't know each other personally, just by sight. On October 4, 2004, Donovan was arrested as he left his parents' home. According to detectives, upon being arrested, the boy said that it took too long to catch him and that he was already waiting for his arrest. Donovan almost confessed the entire crime and gave his version of the events. He said he asked Lee for a ride that day, and while she was driving, he pulled a gun on her and forced her to drive to a nearby park. Once there, he tied her up and put her in the trunk of the car and then walked back to the university to get his vehicle. In possession of his vehicle, Donovan returned to the park and put the victim in his car and drove away. Shortly thereafter, he answered the cell phone of the young woman whose mother was calling and told the woman about the kidnapping. Donovan said he decided to take League's life after seeing that the case had received a lot of media attention and he was afraid of being caught. He made her take off her clothes and gave her a blanket to cover herself. According to the criminal, this was a way of not leaving much evidence at the scene since he later burned her clothes. Donovan says he drove Lee in his car to Walkerville, the same village where her body was later found. There, he said he talked to the victim for a while until the young woman asked to go to the bathroom. He allowed her to go outside and walk over to some trees, and then he took the moment to shoot her. In this statement, Donovan pointed out that all the places he went with Lee and where he got rid of the evidence. He said that the girl told him about the ring that her parents had given her for her birthday, and that he took the ring for himself and hid it in a CD case in his room. To the police, however, Donovan was lying about the crime scene. They believed that the girl had her life taken in another as yet unknown location and that her body was stored in the refrigeration facility as I have already mentioned. 
They also believed that the men lied about how Lee was hit by the shots. As according to forensics, the girl was probably sitting down when she was hit, and not standing up as he said. After the crime, it is believed that Donovan collected the cartridges and stored them with the body. Afterwards, he burned the victim's clothes and other accessories. He then returned to his home, where he wrote a letter of apology to his parents and girlfriend. Donovan said that on the same day of the crime, he knelt down in front of his parents and confessed to being the author of the crime against Lee Matthews. According to him, his mother became hysterical. She had read about the case in the papers and prayed that Donovan's wasn't really responsible for this. All the while, Donovan claimed that he planned and carried out the crime himself and that no one helped him. But for the police, his lying and the evidence points to the participation of more people. In 2005, the trial of Donovan Moodley in the High Court of Johannesburg began. During the trial, several experts testified to prove that he was lying about being solely responsible for the crime. According to the prosecution, there were at least five more people involved in the kidnapping who were being protected by the accused. Donovan's father testified at the trial. He didn't ask for a reduction in the sentence for his son, much less protected him. He just said a few things about Donovan's personality and how he felt responsible for the actions his son took since he is his father. Rob Matthews also testified at the trial. He expressed about how the whole family was completely torn apart and said it was hard to accept that they would never see their daughter again. Rob said that whenever he saw a girl that looked like Lee, his heart jumped for a second, believing that it could be her and that it was all a mistake. After the testimony, Rob shook hands with Donovan's father. The trial lasted just two days. The judge in case, Jubla Bouchain, found the man guilty of all crimes and emphasized that he likely didn't act alone. Donovan was sentenced to life in prison for taking Lee's life. Plus, he also received a sentence of 15 years for kidnapping and 10 years for extortion. He began serving his sentence on August 4, 2005. Still in court, he said the crime was motivated by financial difficulties. Friends and family of Lee, who followed the entire process, wore white ribbons during the trial. In the year 2011, Donovan Moodley tried to appeal the length of his sentence, but the appeal was denied. That same year, evidence emerged pointing to the fact that Lee Matthews was probably not the first person to be kidnapped by Donovan. According to investigations, there were deposits of 92,000 for Donovan in January 2004, which would have been a ransom valued of another victim. In his defense, the man said that money came from a pool table rental business. However, police have determined that these numbers didn't match the value that could be earned by Donovan in this type of business. The police believe that the other possible kidnappings had a favorable ending for the victims, with them leaving unharmed which made them avoid going to the police for fear that the kidnapper would find out and come back after them. In addition, the police reaffirmed the thesis that Donovan hardly acted alone in these crimes, and that they would continue with the wave of kidnappings if the last one hadn't had the outcome it did. According to detectives involved in the case, Donovan never showed any regret or remorse for the crime. He also refuses to name any of those possibly involved in the crime, taking all the blame on himself. This was the story of Lee Matthews, a young woman who had her life taken after being kidnapped, in a crime that had one of the biggest repercussions in South Africa, and that perhaps still has some of its culprits free to this day. Alright folks, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes, and I see you next time.